Okay, hello. Lecture two on analog electronics. Um, this one is called Analog Issues. And this is going to go into more detail about the point I was sort of banging on about in the previous lecture about how even though we have our digital electronics, <coughs> deep down under the hood, everything is an analog circuit and everything is, uh, all information is transmitted by switching electrons on and off and all the things that that can imply and go wrong because of that. So, um, yeah, these are the things I want to cover. So, uh, various main points is there are, there are these resistive, capacitive and, and inductive effects that you might not think about normally when you think of a, a perfect digital circuit. Um, similarly, it's very easy to think of because the electrons move so fast, they travel instantaneously, and so there are very effects, various effects due to that. And uh, frequency, the, 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 the frequency with which circuits are switched on and off can also make an impact as well that aren't necessarily immediately apparent. And another issue here, which is a sort of combination of all these, is that information travelling around our circuit um, generates these transmission line effects, and I'll describe what I mean by that and, and what that implies. So the first point I want to talk about is uh, this resistive effect. So uh, this is certainly a trap I fell into in my early days as a digital electronics designer. It's very easy to, th to, to look at the black box of a, of a CMOS circuit on a PCB and imagine it as a perfect uh, device that switches galvanically, as it were, between the 0 and 5 volt rails or 3.3 volt volts these days. And, and the thing flips and there's no resistance in there and that sort of thing and we, and we can drive these, these circuits very, very fast. In reality, no. Uh, it's, it's just important to hold in your mind that, yeah, this, this model here is much more accurate. There's actually resistances in the way output impedance is usually referred to. Impedance includes other issues as well. Uh, but when people talk about output impedance, you can think of it in the most basic terms like that. So, so we've got our CMOS output here, and that and that behave and that looks more like that than that. Bear that in mind. So, what does that mean in reality? So, a good point is, there's a, it, with a typical CMOS, this resistance here is actually much much bigger than that one. In fact. And that has all sorts of implications. So what's going to happen if we, if we short two gates, so you can see that this circuit here, the output of hit at this is going to be the opposite of that. What's going to win? What's going to happen? Is the circuit going to blow up? And the answer is no, because that is so much larger than that. It means that CMOS can sink more current than it can source. So in other words, if you get a high and a low, low always wins. Simple rule, uh, but it's, it, you can actually exploit that in some circuits as well. It's a bit naughty, but it works. The other thing to bear in mind as well is generally these resistances are sufficiently large so that the current du flowing during that contention won't actually damage the circuit, although you shouldn't really rely on that. You should have some sort of limiting resistor in there explicitly, especially in modern electronics. So because as another implication <coughs> of these finite output impedances, it puts a limit on what that gate can drive, what that output can drive. So in other words, you can imagine quite often we've got an output and we want to drive multiple inputs in another circuit. But it sort of stands to reason that there's a limit on how many, how many outputs we can, how many inputs that output can drive before the amount of current that's flowing out of that gate is too much for the device to deliver. So in other words, we can think of all those inputs soaking up current and can our one poor gate on its own deliver that amount of current? And that's known as fan out, fair enough. And it's usually spe specified explicitly 
in data sheets. That's based on the assumption that we've got the same technologies connecting to each other. So that's quite important because you can end up uh, having a surprising number of devices being, being connected, especially if we've got something that isn't configured explicitly, it's, it's due to some boards plugged into a backplane or something like that. You can end up having more fan out than you might expect. So this is where the fun really starts and we've already hinted at this during, the, during some of the labs. <coughs> as, well as, this, as well as these resistances, We've also got a parasitic capacitance, this capacitance here that appears. How does that get there? We'll talk about that in a second. But the point is, at the moment, it exists. So we can imagine that this is very much a, sl a sponge soaking up currents that when our device initially switches on, the current will initially flow into the capacitor in order to charge it up. This is going to cause this effect here where we'll see a slugging effect on the edge of the current because we can't deliver infinite current. So there's a, tight, there's a brief period during switch on when the current has been soaked up by this parasitic capacitance. And they said put parasitic capacitance in blue. So I've just put that in a jargon buster for you. Also sometimes known as stray capacitance. It depends how, that, how they come about. I'll show you that in a second. But yes, this, is, this isn't explicit capacitance that's there, it's capacitance which has got there due to imperfections, non-idealities in the devices and connections that we're using in our circuit. We've also got inductive effects as well. Usually, so our circuit gets even more complex here. We get parasitic inductances due to various effects, and we'll look at them again. But then the, the, this causes real trouble, and I think this diagram's a wee bit small, but you can see that there is ringing, as it were. So we've created an electronic spring. The mathematics of the thing states that there's uh, a capacitance causing uh, a phase shift in one direction, inductance phase shift in another. The two combine to create a sine wave, an oscillation. And when we switch very fast, we get this effect. We'll talk about what that, what that can cause in a minute. So, a very good example of a, of a combined LC circuit, that's an inductive and capacitive circuit, is one that we're sitting in the middle of right now, and it's called the National Grid. The National Grid is a series of wires strung out across the country and they have capacitance between them and, and between it and the Earth. So there's a capacitive effect. On the end of those wires, yeah. all those motors during the daytime from industry hammering away. And that's, those are generally inductive. So we get the rather interesting effect with the national grid that during the night time it's a capacitive device as all those uh, industrial machines are switched off and there's quite a lot of resistance in the network. During the daytime, uh, there's a lot more inductance, and so the, the, the guys at the generating board and the distribution board have to handle the effects that stem from that. So that's a major electrical effect, but it just brings home the point about how these stray inductances and capacitances are everywhere. And that's quite an interesting anecdote, I always think. So going back to this point I made earlier about we've got these parasitic effects. Where do they come from? And why, why have they? Why are they there? And some of the and most generally they're an inevitable result of the physics of the physical devices that we're implementing our circuit with. So you can it doesn't take much of a leap of imagination to realise that if we have a ribbon cable and a whole load of wires next to each other, they're like the, they, they intuitively you can see that they're like the plates of a capacitor, and that's exactly what they are in many ways. So we, get a, we often get a lot of stray capacitance associated with pairs of cables running long distances. You get inductance as well, because in some ways the a wire is a bit like a bent uh, a spiral, which looks like an inductance, so you can think of it like that. There's even more subtle effects as well. So for example, the very physics of semiconductor devices like CMOS, 
<laughs> it relies on these separately doped devices in an area in between called the depletion layer, which is an area of lacking of electrons. And so intuitively we can see that this is, looks, it looks a bit like a, a capacitor, and in fact that's exactly what it is to some extent. That depletion layer causes a slight capacitive effect. So you can see the very physics of the devices that we're using to implement our electronics are in some ways have got fundamental flaws and limitations in them. So these, these effects are, are inevitable. And so I'm going to restate the fact in, later in this, court, in this talk, but also these effects, as you're probably aware, inductance and capacitance very much <coughs> vary with the switching frequency. We've already, already seen it with that switch on effect. And so the problems can be particularly tricky where we've got circuits that clock themselves at different speeds and different data rates and things like that. So they're inevitable. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't have we cut we shouldn't avoid putting any unnecessary parasitic effects in. I mean here's a good one. I mean this is some this is definitely something that I've been guilty of in my in my early years of circuit design. Look at this great big piece of conductor has been drawn in here on this PCB. Great big long lengths of conductors next to each other. It's a capacitor and an inductor, so don't do it if you can avoid it. A lot of software packages allow you to avoid that as much as possible now, <coughs> but it's very important to know that the effects there and you should, you, you should avoid it if possible. And of course, just the very act of splurging a load of cable on the floor, or unnecessarily long wire lengths, or badly laid out wiring, and it also causes these effects. So there's, cert there's certain parasitic effects that we can't avoid, they're being fundamental to the devices we're using, but that's not to say that we should try and avoid um, our own foolishly introduced mistakes. So going back to that picture I showed earlier, I've already made the point that uh, capacitance and inductance together cause this ringing effect. And you think, well, that's okay, it's not a problem, is it? Surely, the, uh, as, long as, the, as long as the information switches between high and low, we're still transmitting our digital information. <laughs> Not so. Because what's happening here is our signal voltage is undershooting quite heavily under the zero volts. And it's overshooting here over the, over the, the VCC, the, the, the switch on voltage of our devices. And CMOS does not like that. It can cause huge problems because we are what's called reverse biasing gates. In other words, we're putting negative voltages across devices and gates and components <laughs> that don't like that. The physics uh, can be corrupted. So to, to, to make the point, I just want to talk about uh, an anecdote from my long and bitter experience from this sort of thing. I showed you this, uh, this very neat looking board last week, something I did at Rolls-Royce in the 90s. And a very interesting example I came across when developing this board, it, was, it hadn't been PCB at that point, it'd been, I'd made it up as a, as a wire app board effectively for prototyping it. And there was a EPLD, and I'll tell you what an EPLD is, driving into a FIFO, which is a first in first out memory device. So the, a circular buffer, there's some RAM inside and a clock, some clocking hardware that allowed the data to be clocked consecutively into the storage elements of that FIFO. The EPLD was creating a write signal to clock that data in. And I was getting a signal a bit like this, getting quite heavy undershoot due to those ringing effects. And the problem occurred was because that reverse bias was sufficiently large, it was actually corrupting the data inside the FIFO. More specifically, the data that was being corrupted was 
the values of the pointers of where the data was stored. So what I was seeing was data was just coming out of the other side of the FIFO from absolutely random points in the, where, in the stored data that was in there. And in fact, the problem was made even worse by the very fact that when I was attempting to debug the circuit, I placed an oscilloscope, oscilloscope probe on the right enable pin. That oscilloscope probe had enough resistance in it to actually change the behaviour of that undershoot sufficiently so that the behaviour changed. The Heisenberg will be there, or, or will be there one day. So how did I fix it? I'll talk about that in the main lecture. Several ways, several options. So I want these here. I want you to think about that. Yeah, I mentioned a device called an EPLD. Uh, EPLD is bigger than the 90s. They've now been superseded by FPGAs. An EPLD, very simple device. It just meant that instead of the device being uh, runtime configurable, it was purely a, a programmable read-only device that could be erased using UV light, just like in the old days. Um, so absolute revolution at the time, but essentially an FPGA, which needed, which had much longer turnaround time. <coughs> it's also important to bear in mind that different electronics technologies have different switching points. And so we're talking about CMOS, and the there is a, uh, they switch somewhere between a third and two thirds of the VCC, the, the top level rail. And the, the key point there, you'll notice here, the CMOS switches uh, low, below a third, and high above two thirds. So there's a dead region in the middle. So if we don't switch our device cleanly, above those, that, or below that dead region, we're going to get indeterminate behaviour. And so you can see that, that actually erodes quite heavily our, of our margin of how much noise we're allowed to have in the circuit. Different technologies have different effects as well. Um, I want you to be aware of them. I'm not going to talk about TTL and ECL and things like that. I'm going to concentrate on CMOS, but it's important to understand that all the, although I'm using CMOS as an example, the, uh, the general principles apply to all these different technologies. So beware of your switching levels. It's not halfway, and it's not clean cut as to where that switching level might be. So here's a, good, here's a little fun experiment to try out. Take a knot, knot gate and loop it back. What will happen? Will it oscillate? Will it stabilise? If it stabilises, where will it stabilise? OK, I'll tell you the answer for simple CMOS. We loop it back. As you can imagine, a little cocktail party argument would be the device starts to switch high, it crosses the low point, at which point it switches back. And it's doing that infinitely often. And so, in fact, the, the output here, or the entire conductor will settle at the exact switching point for that device. Now there's other technologies which have hysteresis built in, I'll leave you to Google the word hysteresis, and they, will, they can oscillate depending on what the, the size of the hysteresis band is and how fast the slew rate or switching speed of the device can be. So by all means go and have a go at that in the lab. Okay. Just the experiment. So I want to talk about timing. There's various domains where timing is all important, and uh, obviously we're going to talk about digital electronics. So the first thing to bear in mind is these devices are not perfect switches. This was a hole I fell into. It's very easy to think of the the input changing state and instantaneously. The, the output responding to its value, so a knot gate would immediately flip up the other way. 
But they, that is not, that's just not true. Now, it varies a lot from one device to another, different geometries, different technologies. But a good rule of thumb is that the time it takes for the information to sort of propagate through the chip you can think of it out of is of the order of nanoseconds, several nanoseconds, between a few nanoseconds and tens of nanoseconds, depending on the device and the, uh, and the particular geometry that's been chosen. It's also important to remember that, this, that, that those, these numbers aren't constant for a given technology. So how hard we're driving the device, so in other words, how much current we're sucking out of that output, and also how hot the thing's got will affect it. Because you can imagine this effect, as the device gets hotter, the, you can, it, it's quite an easy intuitive uh, argument to accept that that's going to change the behaviour of those electrons that are buzzing around inside that silicon device, and that semiconductor uh, gate that we looked at a moment ago. So beware, they change, and that's going to uh, that's going to be important in a second. <coughs> so that's that's the propagation could delay the, the time it takes for the chip sort of wake up, as it were. Now even when it starts to switch, there's going to be a limit on how quickly it can switch. So we've got things like rise time, otherwise known as slew rate of the output. Now, as we as we as we've talked about. The, the edges are, are, are very indeterminate due to these capacitive effects. So what we tend to do is more think about switch, the time it takes to switch from 10% to 90%. So you can see that, that gives us plenty of margin um, which, uh, around those, those one-third, two-thirds switching points that we talked about. So we talk about the time it takes to switch from that 10% to 90% of bottom rail to top rail. So that's different from your propagation delay, don't forget. Once it starts to wake up, it then has the rise time to contend with. So this key point at the bottom here, it's very easy to think, great, I'll just buy the fastest technology I can lay my hands on. So the smaller and smaller rise time can only be a better thing. Not necessarily. Only switch your devices as fast as you need to. That edge shouldn't be as sharp as it as you can possibly make it because it will cause all sorts of different effects that we're going to talk about, particularly next week in the next lecture. Because essentially, we, dri we shouldn't drive electronics any harder than we need to. It's going to generate uh, electronic noise and it's also going to consume more power than we need to bother with. So good reasons to only make a thing good enough, fast enough. Don't yeah. just make it as fast as possible for the sake of it. So going back to all these timing effects, which boil down to delays in the circuit when we switch. We want to avoid all this because, and we shouldn't be designing electronics which contain quote race hazards. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this already, but this is the name is quite simply uh, comes from the fact that if we've got a signal and it's going down two paths, effectively the information is in a race to arrive at the computing gate, which is effectively what that and is here, uh, to switch the device one way or another, and. The way it will usually manifest itself is a glitch like that, a little spike in information. Now, if you've got an edge-triggered circuit and you're not expecting that, that can cause an absolute disaster in your logic. Uh, we've seen it all before. And most tools, like you know, FPGA design tools, will contain, quote, glitch analysis to make sure that there aren't any race hazards in your, in your design. So I talked about a glitch there. Uh, glitch has got all sorts of different meanings. I've just put it in as a jargon bus to make it. The, the electronics term of it means this electronic spike. So it's important to remember, going back to that previous point about how propagation delays and rise times can vary due to, these due to the environment that the electronics is operating in. And so you can see this effect could change depending on whether it's got hot, whether it's how much power the thing's been asked to, to drive and things like that. So glitching and race hazards and things like that can potentially come and go. So how easy is that going to be to debug? 
So you've got these, got these effects, these timing effects, and they can add up. It's, it's, quite, it's surprisingly easy to inadvertently start chaining devices one after the other, logic one after the other. And these propagation delays and rise times will tend to accumulate. And so a classic case here is if we're feeding a clock in here and we've buffered it, maybe we've buffered it between each slot of the back plane. That would be a classic example. The, uh, the, the, right, the switching on times will, will accumulate and we'll get what's called uh, clock skew, which can cause an absolute disaster because if we're having multiple circuits driven from the same data but we've skewed the clock, uh, we, some of the data might corrupt further down the chain and things like that. So uh, it's a dangerous game, don't do it uh, by careful about your cumulative latencies. Because again, cumulative latencies are going to have the same problem of being variable. So frequency and speed in which we're switching our signals on and off. This is a big deal because as we've already established, uh, different frequencies imply different capacitive and inductive effects. There's other points, there's other effects too as well, the skin effects and transmission lines. So let's let's look at those. <coughs> so first thing is well, what do I mean by high frequency? It's obviously a very relative term. And it's relative to be exact to the amount of capacitance and inductance in our particular circuit. So that's really what defines the sort of frequencies we can drive our machines at. How, how quickly the, obviously there's propagation delays and rise times, but also more subtle effects like these capacitances and inductances. They, 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 depending on how much there is in the circuit, that's going to affect how quickly these frequency effects kick in. And so people will talk about this quote, knee frequency. There's actually a definition of that. I don't want to go into it in this particular uh, talk. But be aware that there is a definition of where this knee frequency is as well, which is essentially the point where we define where the information starts to roll off. In other words, the amount of energy and information that we're able to push through the circuit at a given frequency will start to roll off and the, and the uh, signal will attenuate. So look out for that. There's a very subtle one called uh, skin effect. Um, this is the physics of the electrons going backwards and forwards down the conductor. And there's a rather curious effect uh, where those electrons will migrate to the outside of the conductor. So there's a slightly cocktail party argument about how, oh, is that why coax cable um, is, is used for transmitting very high frequency signals? The answer is no, not really. That's due to other things. But you can imagine, it's a good way of holding it in your mind as, to, as one of the skin effects. And, uh, and so you can see the, the importance of skin effect here, about how the observed resistance of a conductor uh, uh, containing an oscillating signal shoots up as the electrons migrate at high frequency to the outside of the conductor and increase, uh, decrease the apparent available uh, cross-sectional area of that conductor and thus drive the, the resistance up. So all sorts of things go wrong. And isn't that going back to our, <coughs> to our national grid again, <coughs> next time you walk past the power line, look out and see those power lines. You'll notice they don't just have one big fat one. They have multiple, sometimes two like this one, also even up to four sometimes. And that's multiple conductors on the same channel Carrying, uh, carrying the same electricity, but they split it all up to try and minimise skin effect. Have a look at that next time you'll pass the pylon. Again, that's electrical engineering, but the physics is the same. Transmission lines. Transmission lines is a huge subject in its own right. But this boils down to the fact that there's, a, there's an interaction between our electrons flying down the conductor and the end of the, uh, and the speed with which those electrons travel. So, when does a wire become a transmission line? And the official definition is really, is when the wave nature of electrons, if, if you know your, your quantum theory on the electron, can be considered as a wave, and any wave 
can be considered as a series of uh, any square wave or shape wave can be considered as a series of simultaneous waves superimposed on each other. And it's when that starts to matter. But I, the, the model I like to hold in my head is that electrons don't travel instantaneously. We've, also, we've established that they travel at finite speed and we think of it as instantaneous. But in fact, a very good rule of thumb is one nanosecond per foot. And that's 30 centimetres to you. So actually, 30 centimetres is quite, isn't that far. And also, in modern electronics, one nanosecond isn't all that very long either, because I've got a one gigahertz clock oscillating in my pocket right now. And so that's switching on and off once per nanosecond. So what does that mean? It means that if you, if you can have a, a mental picture of an electron being sent down the wire, if, if it's more than 30 centimetres long, and we're, off, and we're switching it on and off at one gigahertz, we've actually switched off our flow of electrons before the electrons arrived at the other end of the wire. So we can even think of it, if we had a very, very long wire stretched all the way across the room, and put a one gigahertz clock on that, you can think of it as a series of pulses, of 15, centi 15 centimetre long pulses flying down that wire. And so what's going to happen when those electrons hit the end of the wire, unless there's something there to soak them up, they bounce back and come back at us. And they superimpose on the signal that's coming down the other way. And so we got all sorts of weird effects, and you can hang a scope on a on a transmission line and see all sorts of strange effects. Here's one of the bounce, the signal coming back. So we can see here, this is at the output and this is it flying back to the input. So we need something to soak up those electrons. Think of it like that at the far end. And so what do we need? We need a resistance to take those electrons away. And that, the value of that resistance is a function, an ideal value of the, of the resistance is generally a function of the, of the properties of the wire and the output of the, de the device that's pushing it down the wire. So we're talking about matching impedance there. So impedance matching, I haven't got it, I should blew that up actually, uh, uh, but I've included it there, which is this understanding that we need our circuit to be designed so the input and the output of our transmission line are matched to each other to maximise the power transfer, in other words, the efficiency of the, of the power transfer and hence the information transfer across that, that gap. Now, obviously, it's going to be, it's going to see it, it's going to manifest itself very, very quickly over a long distance, say kilometres or something like that, so it's a big deal in uh, telecommunications, but with super fast switching electronics like we have these days, it also matters at the circuit level as well. And so sometimes we can find transmission line effects within a PCB. So it's, it's important to understand that it exists. So that's it. That's a pretty fast overview. As, was, as I've hinted at, there's a lot of mathematics that qualifies all these uh, hand wavy descriptions. Um, but I just want you to be aware that they exist, really. So if ever you come across the that, uh, these issues, you'll, you'll know that they're there, and you can go and look into it, and you won't be caught out. <coughs> so three key points, really, I'd just like you to take away with that, is these circuits aren't perfect. They've got all sorts of stray capacitance, resistance, inductance. Some of it is unavoidable due to the very physics of the devices. Other is avoidable due to your good design. The other next point is timing. You can't think of these devices as being perfect in time either. They don't switch on infinitely fast and the information doesn't travel through the devices infinitely quickly. Those effects exist and they can stack up and catch you out. And all these different effects uh, vary particularly with your switching frequency within the circuit. So beware, only drive things as fast as you need to.
and switch them on and off as fast as you need to. Because um, otherwise you will introduce unexpected and unnecessary complications into your design. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions, please get in contact.